My name is Megan. I'm one of the first year clinical nephrology fellows. Um, this morning, I'm very excited to talk to you about rhabdomyolysis. That is an incredibly huge topic, so I've narrowed it down to three parts of it. Um, first, I'll be talking about the pathophysiology of rhabdo, and then two less common talked, commonly talked about sequela or uh, side effects, including hyperuricemia, as well as delayed hypercalcemia. I'd like to start off with some uh, historical trivia, which no one is required to answer out loud, but I'm curious if anybody can imagine what the cause of the first described case of rhabdo was. Was it A, trauma from a covered wagon accident? Was it B, quail meat? C, crush injury from an earthquake? Or D, an unspecified viral plague? You can think on that for a moment. And the answer is actually quail meat. Um, in the Bible, there's a possible description of rhabdo, I should say it's possible. Uh, there was a large group of people who consumed quail meat and then suffered from a plague that was described as having dark stained urine. This was presumably due to hemlock poisoning as quails eat quite a lot of hemlock in the spring apparently. And it's interesting, hemlock poisoning has later actually been described as a cause of rhabdo in more modern literature as well. But the first time rhabdo was actually described in a medical journal was in World War II in the British Medical Journal in the case of a man who was buried by bomb debris with his leg trapped for 10 hours. The graph on the right is a little small and hard to see, but the top line is actually the potassium that you can see rising over the seven days that they were measuring it. And the urea is the line below that, which was also increasing. Lower down, you can see an increase in his blood pressure that was associated with an increased intake and decreased output as his urine output dropped out over the seven days. They did do urine microscopy and just described it as clear yellow fluid, but then they saw a rare, what they called a blood, blood pigment cast. And the patient actually died on the eighth day of his hospitalization, initially he had an irregular heart rhythm, and then he had hypotension and died. They were able to do histology and they found the most interesting changes in the kidneys where they saw interstitial edema as well as a pink material that was in both glomeruline tubules that formed a net with granular material. They also found casts of granular brown material in the tubules, which I think is describing what we know now as ATN. So going back to the pathophysiology of rhabdo, we know that it is caused by skeletal muscle breakdown, but this actually can be caused by two things, either direct cell membrane destruction or by energy depletion, by depleting the ATP at the cells. This leads to dysregulation of calcium homeostasis and essentially causes a massive influx of calcium that then lyses the cell. This releases the enzymes, we know CK, but it also releases aldolase, lactate dehydrogenase, and other enzymes. They all lead to capillary damage and leakage. And then you have edema, which causes intravascular hypovolemia, and then activating the RAS system and leads to a decrease in renal blood flow. We often think of myoglobin as obstructing and damaging the tubules physically as it precipitates with the tamp horsefall protein. And this is potentiated by the metabolic acidosis, but it actually, myoglobin itself actually causes a lot more damage. It goes through an oxidation and creates feral myoglobin, which then induces lipid peroxidation. And these lipid peroxides actually feed back to increase the myoglobin oxidation. It's a positive feedback loop. They also cause oxidative injury in the kidney itself. And the lipid peroxides also cause vasoconstriction. Interestingly, uric acid is also released from muscle cells, forms deposits in the tubules, especially in acidic environments, which can lead to further tubular obstruction. And we'll come back to more about uric acid in a little bit. So sort of putting this all together, the pathophysiology, you have the muscle breakdown, which causes this influx, influx of calcium into the cell, lyses the cell and releases all these enzymes which cause capillary leakage, fluid sequestration in the muscles themselves. The muscle breakdown also releases potassium and phosphate, which we see with hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia when patients come in with rhabdo. The calcium influx into the cells causes hypocalcemia. And then this myoglobin actually is 
more complicated than just depositing the tubules. It gets oxidized, it causes lipid peroxides, which further induce injury in the kidney um, and uh, cause further vaso renal vasoconstriction as well. In terms of how we think about the progression of rhabdo, we do follow CK levels, but they are not actually a predictor of AKI. Usually, if the CK is less than 15,000, the risk of AKI is low. However, I think we've all seen cases where people come in with a low CK, less than 15,000, and end up with pretty severe AKI. The myoglobin is actually what's doing the most damage, but it has an unpredictable metabolism, and so it actually has a low sensitivity for the diagnosis of rhabdo in general. So they created a McMahon score to evaluate for the risk of death or AKI requiring renal replacement therapy. The McMahon store score takes into account the age, the sex, some of the initial lab values, such as creatinine, calcium, CK, where they use a cutoff of 40,000, phosphate, and bicarb. And then you actually get more points if you, your rhabdo is not secondary to seizure, syncope, exercise, statins, or myositis. And they determine that if you have a greater or equal to six score, you are not low risk for rhabdo. However, this is actually only 86% sensitive and 68% specific for predicting death or AKI requiring renal replacement therapy. So like I said, hemlock poisoning and apparently eating quail meat is a cause of rhabdo, but it is less commonly seen these days, I think. But the causes we usually see, especially at a place like Harborview, are trauma. It also can be seen with exertion, which includes exercise, seizures, and alcohol withdrawal. We often see it with immobilization. It's seen with drugs. Um, there's thought to be a direct effect of the drugs, as well as causing seizures or immobilization or trauma. It's seen with certain medications, most notably statins and fibrates, and especially when they're combined together. It can be seen after infections, notably influenza, Coxsackie, Legionella, and now it's been seen quite often with COVID as well. Extreme temperatures, heat stroke, malignant hyperthermia, but actually also in hypothermia. And then metabolic and electrolyte disorders themselves, so hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia can induce rhabdo. It can be seen with toxins, spiders, snakes, and wasps. And there are a lot of genetic defects, including defects of glycolysis, glycogenolysis, glycogen storage disorders, lipid metabolism, and mitochondrial disorders. One notably um, that came up last week actually was McCardle, which is a glycogen storage disorder that kind of always induces low levels of CK. And then it's thought that a second hit would actually induce rhabdo. So I used to live in New York City and the culture of workout classes in New York City is quite intense. Soul Cycle kind of came to its peak fame when I was living there around 2013 to 2015. And there were a number of stories about rhabdo after workout classes, specifically in New York City. So the first New York Times article, as workouts intensify, a harmful side effect grows more common, talks specifically about spinning classes in New York City causing rhabdo. The second article from the New York Times, Getting Fit Even If It Kills You, is actually a 2005 story out of Tacoma, Washington, about a man who went to CrossFit, then spent six days in the ICU with rhabdo, and then returned to CrossFit six months later. And the bottom is actually an article from the American Journal of Medicine that talks about three cases of rhabdo seen in Westchester, all after people's first spin classes. And it was written by a nephrology group who had seen these three cases. And anecdotally, my old boss in New York City also was hospitalized with rhabdo after her first ever soul cycle class in 2013. So it is not rare. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about hyperuricemia, which is not something we often talk about in rhabdo, but it has come up as a question. And I think the more common place we talk about it is actually in TLS or tumor lysis syndrome. It's a very similar pathophysiology. In TLS, the lysed tumor cells release DNA and RNA, which is then metabolized to, in the liver to the uric acid. 
And then similar to myoglobin, the uric acid excretion exceeds saturation and crystals are deposited in the urinary tubules, which causes obstruction, as well as local inflammation. And again, similar to myoglobin, the lactic acid causes urinary acidification, which actually enhances the crystallization. And when we're talking about TLS alone, AKI is typically seen when uric acid is greater than 12. There are other causes where we see hyperuricemia. Anywhere that you have a purine degradation that usually causes uh, is caused by states of high cell turnover. So of course, TLS, it's actually thought to be part of the pathophysiology of mesoamerican nephropathy with sort of low level hyperuricemia repeated, repeated over time. It's seen post cardiovascular surgery. It's thought to be part of radio contrast nephropathy rhabdo, which we'll talk more about, and then cisplatin treatment. These all have a very similar process of the myoglobin leading to tubular obstruction, local inflammation, and the development of an AKI. When talking about hyperuricemia and rhabdo, really it's all case reports. So the first case report I was able to find was a 21-year-old male with epilepsy who was admitted with status epilepticus. His creatinine on day one was two, his CK was just over 4,000, and his uric acid on day one was 16. His creatinine peaked at nine and came down to 4.8 on day five. His CK actually just trended down, the peak was on admission, and trended down to 3,500 on day five, and his uric acid peaked at 20 before coming down to five on day five of his stay. He was started on dialysis due to oliguria, and his AKI resolved within six weeks. What I think is interesting is in this case, he was actually brought in immediately post-seizure. He had been seizing for about two hours. And so it does seem like that CK was probably not significantly higher before presenting to the hospital. And it really never was that high. And thinking about rhabdo, we said, you know, the chance of an AKI is less if your CK initially is less than 15,000. So it's interesting that his uric acid was actually significantly higher and was possibly the driver of his AKI in this scenario. There have been studies looking at how to prevent this. Um, they have been in mice. I have not seen human studies, but there is a glycerol, which is an intramuscular injection that can induce a rhabdomyolysis AKI. It causes increased CK levels, muscular damage and inflammation, renal vasoconstriction, myoglobin casts, renal tubular injury, apoptosis, and inflammation. So once mice are injected with the glycerol, they essentially have rhabdo and progress to an AKI. Allopurinol blocks xanthine oxidase, which converts hypoxanthine and xanthine, which are purine degradation products, to uric acid. And so in this study, they actually pre-treated mice with allopurinol before injecting them with glycerol. What they saw was that in the mice who were treated with allopurinol, it reduced renal inflammation and decreased levels of uric acid in the renal tissues, which then inhib inhibited the inflammasome cascade and caused less damage. And interestingly, in the imaging you see, on the left, the glycerol-induced mice have tubular damage, and the right with the glycerol plus allopurinol is actually showing the pro proliferation of tubular cells when treated with allopurinol. So it not only prevented damage, but it also helped rebuilding the tubular cells. Obviously, if we knew when people would get rhabdo, it would probably be great to pre-treat them with allopurinol, but we don't really have that luxury. But we, it is something we do in TLS for prevention. The other medication to think about in this scenario is raspiricase, which promotes the... Uh, change from uric acid to allantoin, which is water soluble and highly excretable. This is a case report out of Taiwan that was a two pediatric patients who both came in with severe rhabdo and hyperuricemia. The first patient was a 15 year old who ingested ecstasy during a suicide attempt, had a tonic clonic seizure and ended up with severe hyperthermia. The second case was an 11 year old with heat stroke after jogging outside in July who came in with severe hyperthermia as well. They both initially underwent intensive cooling, IV fluids, furosemide, and mannitol with a diagnosis of rhabdo. 
For the first patient, he received resbiracase on day one because his uric acid was checked when he came in and it was 20. Interestingly, his CK was 10,000 on day one, but did peak at 130,000 on day three. The second patient came in without a uric acid check the first day, but on day two was found to have a uric acid of 13. And their CK on day one was actually only at 2,000, but did come up to 21,000 on day two. Both of these patients were given case the day their uric acid was checked with a dramatic improvement in the level the following day. And they both also had a lowering of their serum creatinine and improvement in urine output after the case was given. I think in this short amount of time, three days, it's very hard to tell if their CK had just peaked and was improving on its own, or if their aspiracase actually helped improve their creatinine overall. So like I said, these were really all case reports. Most case reports of hyperuricemia and rhabdomyolysis were after a seizure. Um, and so there may be something specific to that, but there really isn't a lot of evidence or guidance on what to do. I think it's also interesting that we see reduced renal function causing an elevated uric acid, but then the elevated uric acid could also be causing the reduced renal function. And we don't really know where on this loop the patient is when they arrive at the hospital. But it made me think of some questions. Should we be checking uric acid in all of our rhabdo cases? Maybe should we be checking uric acid when the degree of AKI seems to be out of proportion to the CK level that they came in with? And could case be useful in preventing additional tubular injury in rhabdo and possibly result in less need for renal replacement therapy? So leaving you with maybe more questions than answers, I'd like to talk about another sort of less commonly discussed complication of rhabdo, which is delayed hypercalcemia. And this actually came up from a case that I uh, had at Harborview this fall of a 21-year-old male who had an unwitnessed hypothermic V-fib arrest. He had CPR started in the field and was continuously ongoing when he arrived in the ED. So it was immediately started on VA ECMO and had an impella placed. He came in as a doe, so we don't have any of his medical history, but you can see his creatinine was 1.1 on arrival. Bicarb was 19. Potassium was 3.1, so no urgent indications for dialysis. He came in with a calcium of 7.4, and his CK was only 5,600 with a lactate of 11. He was pan scanned on arrival, and his initial imaging was unremarkable. His initial course was complicated by left leg ischemia from the vascular access for the ECMO as well as the impella placement. So his CK actually jumped from 5,600 to 75,000 from day one to day two. They were able to rearrange some of the ECMO cannula and it did start downtrending, but then kind of quickly started uptrending once again. And on hospital day five, CRRT was started for oliguria, volume overload and hyperkalemia. You can see his labs here. When CRRT was started, his creatinine had come up to 3.4. His potassium was at 5.9. He was getting IV bicarb, so his bicarb had actually improved to 21 and his calcium had dropped to 6.6. At this point, his CK was 52,000 and still rising. So on hospital day six, he actually underwent bilateral lower extremity fasciotomies that revealed, revealed necrotic muscle, and it was recommended that he have lower extremity amputations. His CK peaked at this point at 57,000, and then there were a lot of conversations about his neuroproctosis, family situation, social situation, so that amputations were a few days delayed from the recommendation. And over those few days, his CK did come down to 8,700. And then he underwent his bilateral lower extremity amputations. This is a graph of his calcium trend from the day he arrived to the day of his amputations. So you can see the only time it really started to significantly improve was when he was started on CRRT. And then there's a massive drop when he was off CRRT in the OR for his amputations, but he had gotten up to a normal total calcium level just prior. After the OR, he was restarted on CRRT, moved to intermittent HD, and when his urine picked out and he was hospital day 25, he actually came off of dialysis. So what you're seeing here on the left is his creatinine trend from the bottom is when he stopped dialysis. On the right is the calcium trend. And again, the bottom is the day of stopping dialysis. So his creatinine, you can see, was pretty much 
overall downtrending from the day of stopping dialysis until 10 days later. However, the calcium, which was normal when getting dialysis, jumped up to 12 and then stayed around 10 to 12 until 10 days later as well. So there are about 60 case reports in a PubMed search about delayed hypercalcemia in the setting of rhabdo. They occur during the polyuric phase of recovery from ATN. The proposed mechanisms include resolution and mobilization of soft tissue calcifications, a PTH increase during the hypocalcemic phase, which then causes increased calcium resorption from the bone, and a release of 25 hydroxycholecalciferol from muscle, which then gets converted to activated vitamin D once the kidneys recover their function and then increases the calcium level. And then a lot of these patients who've been on supplementation, it, it sort of gets held over and can cause hypercalcemia. This image is actually from a case report very similar to our case um, of a young gentleman who came in with rhabdo and ended up with an amputation. This was a technetium scan that showed the amount of calcium phosphate deposition he had in his left thigh, even after the amputation of the ne necrotic muscle. Interestingly, in all these case reports, there's one literature review that notes that the PTH and vitamin D levels across these reports does not correlate with the hypercalcemia. So the leading thought is that is mostly the resolution and mobilization of the soft tissue calcifications. In our patient, that did seem to be true. On hospital day 31, he happened to have a CT scan done with concern for an ileus unrelated to the calcium. And it was found to have calcium deposits in his left gluteus, left rectus muscle, and left upper thigh, which you can see on the imaging here. So with this mobilization of calcium delayed from the initial rhabdo, what do we actually do about it? So the first thing I think is stop the supplementation. Often these patients have been started on calcium, possibly calcitriol, and then we sign off when the urine output picks up and they come off of dialysis. And sometimes those supplementation can get held over. So I would say we should consider stopping the standing supplements when we're signing off or when we notice their urine output picking up. Most of the case reports describe starting with IV fluids to treat the hypercalcemia. This likely coincides with the need for fluids during a post-ATN diuresis, so it works well for that as well. The next step people went to for treating this was calcitonin, which stimulates the calcium deposition in bones, reduces the calcium reuptake in kidneys, and can help more transiently than something like bisphosphonates, which are also some, somewhat contraindicated in renal failure. And then in severe cases, um, there were a few cases of calciums getting up to 17 to 20. They were restarted on renal replacement therapy, but they often found they had rebound hypercalcemia if they went back on intermittent dialysis, and that most of them required a low calcium bath in order to correct it. Not only is this a human problem, but this has been seen in animals as well. This is a case report of the management in a sea lion that had sarcocystis neurona, which is a parasite that causes a spectrum of neurologic diseases, but in this sea lion caused a myositis and rhabdo. I, don't, I didn't know the normal ranges, but they're here for you, but the CK peaked at 300,000. The sea lion's creatinine peaked at 3.97. And then as you can see in the graphs, the BUN, the creatinine, the CK, everything started trending down. Yet after that, he progressed to polyuria and subsequently became more lethargic and more hypercalcemic, as you can see on the graphs as well. He was actually treated with nasal calcitonin and made a full recovery. So back to our human case for a moment. This was a 21-year-old male who had an unwitnessed hypothermic V-fib arrest, who had rhabdo, lower extremity amputations, and then had a delayed hypercalcemia as his creatinine was returning to baseline. Our first thought was actually that his tube feeds contained too much calcium. So we changed his tube feeds from osmolite to a lower calcium formulation, but then he developed an ileus. And so it wasn't clear that this was actually contributing significantly to his calcium levels. We also started him on fluids. As you can see, his urine output was greater than three liters daily. And so I think his calcium was also exacerbated by the volume depletion from the polyuria, but despite fluids keeping up with his urine output, he still remained hypercalcemic for about 10 days 
And so I do think he was having this release of the calcium from his muscles as seen on in his imaging a few days prior. So some of the take home points um, from a very small portion of a very large topic. I think it's helpful to recall the broader pathophysiology of rhabdo. We talk a lot about the myoglobin deposition, but it's doing a lot of other things within the kidney that are not just physically obstructing the kidney. I think it's interesting to consider whether hyperuricemia may be contributing to AKI, and if there may be a role for case at certain levels of the hyperuricemia. And then I think it's incredibly useful to remember that as the creatinine improves and as the nephrology team is often about to sign off, hypercalcemia may develop. And so consider stopping standing supplementation when a patient becomes polyuric or just being a little more cautious about watching the rise in the calcium as it seems like the patient is starting to have renal recovery. This is a photo from uh, Tank Lakes in the Cascade, which is a rhabdo inducing climb up boulder fields, but it is worth the myoglobin deposition if anyone ever wants to go there. Um, and I would just like to say thank you to my co-fellows for always sharing interesting cases, to Sarah Sangavi for her guidance on my presentation, and to Leah Hazley for teaching me about delayed hypercalcemia so that we could care for our patient. Thank you, Megan. Beautiful presentation and quite a range of examples running from you know, um, spin classes in New York to, to sea lions and, and a case from Harvard. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, questions for Megan. Oh, one, 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 one quick observation, if I may. Uh, one of the unusual cases which people often miss is a group of uh, young adults who develop uh, frequent rhabdo, sometimes very mild, sometimes severe. And in those patients, um, usually you find carnitine uh, abnormality or abnormality mm -hmm. of carnitine metabolism. And I think we should always keep that in mind. Yeah, I will say the list of genetic causes of sort of this chronic low-grade rhabdo is quite extensive um, and involves like every part of the pathophysiology. But I have seen that in adults, uh, usually yeah. in adults who are exercising. I had a question, Megan. That was a very, very interesting talk. Thank you. I'm curious. I, I, I feel like I see more and more athletes using these uh, ice and cold baths after exercise. And, mm -hmm. and you mentioned association with hypothermia and, and, and rhabdomyolysis. Had you come across anything in your, uh, in your, when you're in your search for studies about associations with increased use of these ice baths um, with rhabdomyolysis or AKI, or I imagine it may be tough I to cheer out with, uh, and yeah. Obviously, these people are exercising too, but just curious if you came across anything like that. I didn't. And I wonder if, first of all, I wonder if the damage has already been done because the pathophysiology and exercise seems to be more related to the ATP depletion than to physical muscle damage. Um, and so I don't know how cooling down would help that, but if there was any additional damage from hyperthermia, it would maybe prevent a little bit of additional, but I, I haven't, I didn't read anything about that in the exercise induced. I was wondering if we could, this is a wonderful talk. I was wondering if we could go back to your questions about uric acid and hear what folks think, because that was really thought provoking. You know, if, if it's kind of a, you know, I, if we start checking uric acid on these patients, then I can imagine, you know, um, Te uh, primary teams getting really nervous about the levels and wanting to, you know, use that as an indication for dialysis. So I was curious to hear others' thoughts. I will say, um, I was trying to remember in residency here on the hematology team, we had a cutoff for giving case, and I actually can't remember if it was nine or 12 when people, when patients had a high risk of TLS. Um, and so I was sort of wondering if we can extrapolate from that and, but respiratory case is extremely expensive if I remember. I mean, if we go by uric acid pathophysiology, um, you know, 
in one way, like alkalinizing the urine would help, you know, with myoglobin and, and uric acid, but it would also precipitate xanthine and, and hypoxanthine crystals. So I guess from mm -hmm. resuscitation perspective, saline would be preferred over over bicarb. But yeah, the 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 respiratory case question is is dicey. I mean, I'm I'm at Montlake and we have a patient who has AKI and uric acid. They checked uric acid; it's high. So what should we do? And she has a solid organ tumor, not not the ones causing tumor lysis, but she also has solitary kidney, and you know it's not not able to handle the uric acid. So we may give raspberry case, but yeah. I would say I liked Megan what you had said about being selective with your choice of who you might check uric acid at. And you um, presented a few cases where things didn't seem to fit um, how you'd expect in terms of the natural course of rhabdomyolysis based on the CK levels. So maybe there is a select group of people that don't fit our, our uh, illness script for rhabdomyolysis. And those are people who may benefit from a check, knowing that every single person with AKI is going to have an elevated uric acid and, mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's going to push you to dialysis because we do have such effective medications like raspiricase, but it is, it, if you check it, like Laura said, you're probably gonna have to do something with it and it is going to be high. More support for your general point of just understanding physiology and um, anticipating those complications. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Beautiful talk. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker.